and we are live. Hi everyone, a very happy Tuesday and welcome to our Arm Tech Talk series. This is the place for the latest and greatest in trends, technologies and best practices from Arm and our ecosystem. I'm super thrilled you can join us today. You may have noticed we're in a different location than usual. Uh, it's not my kind of home office studio and we normally find at these Arm Tech Talks, we're actually in the Cambridge office live hosting Massimo Benzi from Arduino. I'm super excited that we're hosting him today from Arduino. Uh, we've got a fantastic tech talk lined up for you and uh, we're going to hear all about it and all about uh, the latest from Arduino and the Arduino Pro line with industrial automation later on in the tech talk. Uh, but before we get started, I've just got a couple of little housekeeping items. So Massimo, if you can do the honors and do a next slide, that'll be amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, so if you want to get involved in the conversation today, you can, of course, tweet us using the hashtag arm tech talks. Uh, I think we've reached 70 tech talks. This might actually be the 70th tech talk we've done, Massimo. So you're reaching a big milestone today. Uh, it's great you could join us uh, and live and in person in Cambridge again. It's just phenomenal. Um, so we can view all of these 70 plus tech talks on demand. Just head to YouTube youtube.com slash arm if you like what you see uh, and all of our upcoming talks are on arm.com slash tech talks we've got one more next week uh, and then we're on a little summer break before we pick it up again in september so do check those out then uh, but of course you're not here to listen to me today you're here to listen to massimo from arduino uh, it's great to have a celebrity in the house uh, as it were uh, we're really excited to have him hosting today uh, he doesn't need a speaker bio you know who he is uh, so we're going to get to questions at the end please put your q as questions in the q a box on zoom in the menu bar below if you're on zoom uh, and we'll get to those at the end i'll keep on on them as we come in uh, so massimo thank you so much for coming all the way to cambridge today and joining Hello. us for our arm tech talk uh, why don't you take it away and tell us about how arduino pro is changing the paradigm of industrial automation thank you thank you very much um, yeah, I'm going to give a little bit of a background, so where we came from and how the work that we have done in all these years is applying to essentially what we call now Arduino Pro, which is our approach to professional industrial uh, you know, automation, but also any professional industrial application. So Arduino was born in this place, which is a design school that no longer, the building still exists, but it's no longer a design school in the Northwest of Italy. And I think one of the interesting features is Arduino is a technological platform that was born not in an engineering school or in the R&D department of a company, but actually started off in a design school where we worked on something called interaction design. So the idea that how do you design the way people interact with technology? You know? Can you create a language that makes the experience of interacting with technology more pleasurable, more functional, more practical? So the only way to make sure that that happens is to go through this process of designing, building, testing, and repeating. And this process has to kind of you know, be repeated until you get it just right. And so the work they were doing was based on the idea that you could prototype with electronics, but the students didn't have a lot of background in, in, in electronics. So we had to invent something uh, that could be used to prototype electronics with very limited knowledge on a, on a budget, uh, really, but in a way that will also be conducive to sharing and in a way, uh, learning about the platform. So I think the output of this work that we did there is your classic 8-bit Arduino board that you see here in the form that it took in 2000. And it, it started off as an open source project in 2005, but the form you see here is from 2010. One, uh, one interesting aspect is that after we worked on that more prototyping aspect, we realized that it was a tool for innovation and, you know, in a way, our motto became enabling anyone to innovate by making complex technology simple to use because microcontrollers was the first thing that we worked on, but then we realized there were IoT and a bunch of other areas where you can apply, in a way, this Arduino recipe and really change the way people perceive and understand technology and, the, in a way, creative use of technology. So... As I mentioned, Arduino started off as a simple 8-bit platform, and we still make, in a way, that hardware as a sort of intro. But already, you know, when we started to become quite famous or quite visible uh, in the market, people started to, to say, when are you going to make an 32-bit ARM Arduino? So this, I just got this screenshot from an article from 2012 we actually launched the first Arduino with a 32-bit 
Cortex M3 ARM microcontroller, which in those days was a bi- was big news because we we were evolving from like a simple 8-bit platform to something more powerful with more better peripherals. And in fact, you can this Arduino do it pops up a lot in, for example, in uh, academic research papers where you see like universities or labs using this to do uh, complicated data gathering, uh, data logging, or, or or to control experiments. So it really moved Arduino from like a more, let's say, educational platform to something that would be useful for a larger for a larger audience. And some aspects of the Arduino platform that I think it was important for us that helped us a lot is the fact that we embraced open source. So Arduino is basically one of the first, probably the first really popular open source hardware uh, platform, which was specifically released as open source hardware, software. Also because we wanted to take advantage of the freedoms of, of, of open source. Now, the idea that on top of just running the software or using the hardware, you could study it, you could share it, you could improve it. This idea that you would share the work that you do with a community is the one, it's kind of the, the in a way, the, the, the idea, you know, the, the, the push, the creation of a very large community. I have some numbers later on. Another thing that was very important with us is to, to really work on the, on the methodology for teaching technology. So the learning by doing, learning by making things. So this is a younger me with a lot more hair, teaching my students by learn, by making stuff. And um, and re- literally we, we changed in a way the, uh, you know, the, the way people approach this technology to make it more accessible to a wider audience. The use of design to demystify technology. So. In a way, use the design that you would use for a consumer uh, a product with a piece of hardware just to say, hey, you know, it's okay. It's accessible. It's usable. And um, and also, in a way, the made in Italy. So the idea that still now 95% of what we do, even more than that, is, is manufactured in Italy. So there's a certain level of quality, yes, but there's also a certain level of attention to sustainability, the impact on the environment, uh, and also, you know, the the the, the fact that we we have a community in a way that we support, uh, you know, that uh, that that builds the the Arduino products. So these are some of the ingredients that, in my opinion, translated this initial experiment that was used. It was literally designed for fifty people, no, or a hundred people by me and my co-founders, uh, David Quartieres, uh, Tom Igo, David Mellis. So the idea was really applying all these different ingredients to create something that would have a strong community behind it, based on open source, really solving all sorts of problems. And people did use it to solve all the problems. Just some quick, quick examples. So for example, here, this is one of the earliest projects that I saw people do, which I really liked. Somebody built a cat feeder they would uh, they would deliver different food to different cats based on a on a RFID um, chip in the collar, and they used a, an old DVD reader to create this open door. And you see, it's it's a cardboard box. It's kept together by tape, and it's got some LEDs. But the idea is that somebody wanted a product that didn't exist, and very quickly was able to create one. So this ability to turn an idea into something functioning, although you know in a, a bit scruffy like that was was in a way one of the powerful uh enabling ideas of arduino then people applied it to a lot of different solutions now i have some random some random examples like this uh, person in switzerland for example used a, a spare a laser from a from a dvd from an xbox to create a laser scanning microscope that uses the Arduino technology to read data from that particular sensor and bring it to the to an app. So, so you can create scientific instruments that replicate the function of much more expensive devices on a lower cost with Arduino technology. Or for example, more, you know, let's say less serious products like this uh, robotic bartender, which, you know, builds a cocktail based on a recipe by moving the glass back and forth or uh, one area where people use Arduino a lot is to build interfaces for musical instruments. 
So a lot of digital music performances, or is there's basically a person nearly, you know, bending over a laptop. And so if you create tools that make, make digital music more expressive, uh, tools like that is a digital flute that generates MIDI signals. I think it's quite interesting as a, as a tool, um, but also a very serious project. This is a, uh, a project that dates back to when the Fukushima disaster happened and there was an explosion, a nuclear explosion. And so a group of enthusiasts started to build sensors that were somehow based on the Arduino technology to, to, to measure the radiation, send it to, to the cloud and visualize it on a map. And I think, I think that was very important for me as a project to see really people getting together and creating um, tools that would allow them to challenge the information provided by the government, which eventually had to admit that there was more radiation, it was more widespread than originally imagined. There also some funnier project. This is a project that was released by Barilla, the pasta maker from Italy. It's it's a tool that enables this thing they call passive cooking. So the idea that you don't need to keep the fire on throughout the cooking process of the pasta. So you can actually save a lot of energy by turning off the heat in the right moment. And inside here, there is an Arduino that measures the temperature, figures out when it's a good time to turn off the heat and sends you a message via Bluetooth to an app that they made available. Uh, and again, I just, you know, it's a funny project, but in a way it supports potentially a sustainability habit to use less energy to, to, to have the same culinary effect. Another important area is where open source 3D printers embrace Arduino technology. And there's a bunch of softwares uh, that, that they run essentially using the Arduino platform that are still powering a lot of these printers. One of the side effects of this is that now you have these 200 pounds, even less kits that you can buy online for making your own printer that are powered by Arduino where the software is open source. You just need an Arduino development environment to build something. So the way you see people like uh, this person who repurposed one of these cheap printers to create a robot they would pick up a slide film and put it inside a scanner to scan it. So to automate the whole process of scanning, I saw a bunch of other examples, for example, somebody using a printer like this to automate uh, uh, lab experiments uh, for, for chemistry, for uh, bio, bio experiments. So in a way, once you have a platform that it's very easy to hack, then you will see a ton of different uh, experiments coming out because of also the community aspect. Arduino it was the first software that ran drones that was open source. Uh, it started, it's, it's still called Arduino because the origins of this was essentially a software that you could write and compile with Arduino. And one last example that I really like, this young woman started to wonder in high school, how can you detect breast cancer? No? And so she, if a dog can detect it, can you create some hardware that does the same? So obviously she went to university, she worked on her idea. She was able to build this box that contains an Arduino board and a sensor that she designed to detect breast cancer from a urine sample. And for that, she won the James Dyson Award, which I think it's a nice explanation of that phase of Arduino as a tool for experimentation, for innovation, for discovering new idea, for developing idea. So one of the things that happened is that suddenly we started to see a bunch of projects of people using Arduino boards that were basically consumer products, building industrial applications. So this is just a random example from a YouTube video where someone is actually building an industrial solution for, for, for a bottling plant. Uh, this was a user that I don't know anything about. I found it on YouTube, just to say the, 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 the amount of people doing this. Pro stuff using Arduino Megas, for example, which were not designed for, for, for industrial application, but the robustness of the product, the simplicity, and the fact that a lot of these automation applications are really simple things. You don't need incredible computing power made us think, hey, you know, we need to really go after this and enable this. So 
we created this part of Arduino called Arduino Pro that creates products that are still compatible with the whole Arduino ecosystem, still philosophy, still philosophy, but they are designed and manufactured to industrial uh, certification in industrial processes. So you can now take these products and, you know, for example, this call is this called the Portenta machine control. We'll see later it was developed in partnership with a company that makes industrial ovens. So this is essentially it's a very powerful microcontroller-based product. There's a Cortex M7 and a Cortex M4 inside our microcontroller. So you can use this to, for, to process control an, an oven, but at the same time extract the information that you can send to the cloud to generate, for example, a digital twin of the oven. And this was one of the first products that we built to enable this transition and uh, specifically for the kind of project that we call internally retrofitting. So there's a bunch of existing industrial equipment that you want to enable for you know, uh, what we call in the industry 4.0 in Europe or in the US, they call it advanced manufacturing, whatever you call it, there is this transition of existing equipment that we want to modernize with this, you can do it. So basically, once you build something that's connected, you know, like this oven that we just mentioned, you have to go all through all these different steps and you need software, tool chain, machine learning libraries, security. So there's a lot of different things that you need to keep into account when you build this solution. So it's not a very simple uh, endeavor. And then you have this choice. You now, do you do like a chip down design? So you pick a chip, you design a circuit. So there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of costs, specialized uh, and expensive uh, knowledge, or do you use system on modules? which is a great solution, but sometimes they are proprietary tools that, that, that try to lock you into a specific vendor. There's not a lot of customization. So one of the things that we have to reckon with is the fact that open source is now evading as is every, any part of software. And it's actually getting even into the industrial space. So more and more enterprise software is open source. Right now, if you're developing a web application and somebody shows up and says, let's use this proprietary tool. People are gonna look at you and say, no, I don't think so. They're gonna use an open source library to build it because that particular part of the software world has completely transitioned to open source. It's happening everywhere. So Arduino in a way has a history since we went sort of, we started to have the first commercial use of Arduino around 2008. We have a history of actually building uh, open source hardware, software, tool chain, and a large community uh, through different steps to really enable this process of applying the uh, Arduino formula to the pro market. I think one interesting thing to look at is if you look at uh, LinkedIn, you will find more than 500,000 people that man mention Arduino as a skill uh, on LinkedIn. Two out of five engineers mentioned Arduino is one of the skills. We have an estimated you know, user base for the development environment of Arduino of over 30, 30 million people. So we have some platforms like our forum that has more than 1 million uh, people active on the forum. So it's a large community made of all sorts of different people. So one of the things that we are doing now with Arduino Pro is really leveraging all this open source technology, the community, uh, and really creating a version that that applies to companies. So we really take this, in a way, uh, community knowledge and make it available open source uh, to somebody trying to build an enterprise, uh, enterprise application. And one of the interesting things about Arduino is that we provide all of the elements that you see on the left, from the device hardware, the software, the communication, the cloud. So if you want to build an end-to-end -end solution, you can use the whole Arduino Pro platform, uh, or you can just pick and choose. You can use the hardware, you can use the development tools. We also integrate with clouds that are not Arduino, and there's a lot of open knowledge that's available. Uh, and I think that's, that's an important change in the way people do industrial applications. You know, there are some industrial vendors that if you want to register for their forum, you have to apply and then you wait for up to a week that they approve you. 
uh, in the same time, somebody that starts with Arduino from scratch while it's waiting for the other forum to approve him or her <laughs> has already built a solution. So I think that's kind of the, the speed, no? Community, low code, but working in enterprise setting. Uh, and I think, you know, in a way, we've been providing products for over 10 years. So it's when we make a product that has customers, we keep making it for years and years and years. We test every single hardware product in the factory. So we guarantee very low, low level of failure, if any. And then, you know, it's a, we have a very good supply chain that we can document and demonstrate. And we also provide enterprise level support now. So it's a different Arduino from the one that we are used to. And we actually very, very careful now to really look at all the best security practices. For example, all of our hardware comes with this hardware secure element that makes security central to the way we create connected uh, products, which is also one of the things that ARM is really passionate about. So there's a little logo down there that says that we, one of our products is, is even PSA certified. So we work with ARM to certify one of our hardware products, we are getting ISO certified. So we are, so in a way, different things that basically say, look, the Arduino that you're looking at is not the one that you are used to, it's not the one you think it is. It's a different, applying the same formula, the same value, the same advantages, but to something that can work in a, in a real environment. And it has been used in a number of use cases. So here you see some of them, but manufacturing, building and automation, transportation and mobility, smart cities, agriculture. These are all places where there is an Arduino use case. That's all based on our technologies uh, that we have. Just some a quick example of things that we've done. So as I said, the Portenta machine control was originally developed in partnership with a company making ovens for, uh, for food production. So these allow them to take their products to a next level, manage them remotely, uh, you know, intervene uh, on the product if they need to. So it's it really kind of shifted uh, the value of that particular product and that company one step up. Or we built projects where we integrated this uh, product, uh, one of our smaller products to do predictive maintenance and a number of other uh, monitoring for um, air conditioning equipment. Or we used one of our uh, more powerful products, this Portenta, Portenta X8 is actually a quad core Linux ARM based board with a dual core microcontroller that's designed for when you need more powerful connectivity is called the Portenta X8. It's the one that's PSA certified. And this was used to build EV charger, which is a very contemporary uh, use case. So in a way now with Arduino, you can actually scale from the ideation. So we even do innovation workshops with companies. So we go into a company for a couple of weeks, we work with the company, we kind of unlock some of the creativity from inside the company. We guide the idea generation, and then we even produce prototypes. So we can actually produce a prototype and we do it for a, for a, for a fixed cost. And then we help with the integration with existing hardware. We do a lot of different activities that help the famous retrofitting that we discussed to help really move a company uh, to take advantage of the latest uh, technologies. So in a way now Arduino is really to the point that these solutions, so the one, uh, I'll go in more detail on the product that you see in the slide, but they're available from the major distributor and even amazon.com. So it's very easy to, 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 to get to them. So let's see a couple of products very quickly. So this is the Nicholas Sensemi. It's, it's one inch by one inch. So it's very, very small. It's running a Cortex M4F with very high quality Bluetooth connectivity from Nordic. A bunch of very cool sensors from Bosch, like IMU, humidity, um, air pressure. It's got battery management, and it's also got this really cool sensor that works on analyzing gases. 
uh, I have I am wearing one of them right here. It's blinking green because the air quality in this room is good. And we developed this particular solution with Keyway, which is an Italian slash French company that makes jackets in Italy. It's quite popular right now. And so it was nice to experiment with them. And we did a bunch of, we actually ran a competition where people built a bunch of application to see, hey, what happens if you have that kind of technology embedded in your jacket? And so we also do this kind of thing. So we we actually use our connection with the community to enable the community to come up with interesting ideas. Same format in terms of size, but this is a dual core STM32 microcontroller based with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and a camera that can be used for embedded computer vision applications. And, you know, uh, customers used it on a production line in a bottling plant to check if the cap was correctly mounted on the bottles, you know, lots of different uh, applications. The cool thing about this is that it's programmed in a special version of Python called MicroPython. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a full Python with embedded computer vision uh, libraries uh, from uh, this company called OpenMV. So this allows, for example, the people who have learned Python in school, for example, very quickly build completely cloudless computer vision application. So just an example, this is a vineyard pest monitoring uh, tool. Uh, this box has a piece of paper at the bottom that's soaked with a pheromone that attracts specific types of insects. And then when they are in the trap, it takes a picture every few minutes. It counts the number of insects of a specific type. This was trained on this uh, uh, sort of uh, Japanese green uh, beetle that is very, very deadly for, for, for vineyards. So you want to know exactly when one of these shows up because otherwise when they are in your vineyard, your you know situation is cannot be fixed. So these things, basically make sure that the farmer doesn't have to go around the field constantly to check or the current traps are very rudimentary. This thing sends you a message and says how many insects it has detected. And it's all without cloud. It's just, uh, it can be powered by simple solar power. So there's, there's quite a lot of features in this that are very, very useful. And it can be trained on any insect. We also made this micro PLC with this company called Finder which is an Italian company that's quite well known in the world of relays for making relays for almost 80 years. And so we built this micro PLC, which is based on the same dual core Cortex M7 plus Cortex M4 processor from STM, uh, ST, STM Electronics. And what the ARM technology allows us to do here is that you can have a PLC that for the first time you can run your you know, control cycle well, the control algorithm, but at the same time, you can actually communicate with the cloud and extract the same exact data that the control algorithm use can go to a digital twin. Uh, it comes with onboard connectivity, it's got RS-485, Ethernet, USB, and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. So you can use it in multiple different ways. You can run tiny machine learning algorithm directly in the PLC. It's very low cost, and it can be programmed with the classic C++ Arduino framework or Python, or we actually partner with a company that makes industrial uh, PLC IDEs. And we even created a, an IDE that allows you to program uh, some of our devices, including the PLC, using the classic ladder logic or the other classic PLC uh, languages. So effectively, it doesn't matter where you come from. There is a technology that allows you to program. And I would say, you know, the flexibility of the ARM ecosystem really enables these multiple languages um, that are available right now, that are tested, that are robust. Uh, you know, it's it's very, it's it's not possible to find the same level of completeness of the, of the ecosystem outside of the ARM ecosystem. So I think this is one of the many, many, advantages of us embracing very, very strongly the ARM ecosystem. Just uh, this is a quick, quick example. So that Nicola Sense mounted on a fan, 
you can see that it's able to detect through a tiny ML algorithm using the sense ML framework. It can detect if somebody is blocking the fan, some the, the fan is vibrating. It can even detect if uh, some object is blocking the, the fan. And, and this only by looking at vibration and sounds uh, of a simple little device that's just mounted externally from a mechanical component. And this is the classic industrial condition monitoring problem. But, you know, this is implemented very simply at, uh, you know, reduced cost. And this application of TinyML for us is quite important because we can, uh, you know, we can really enable a lot, of, a lot of different user scenarios. Just a quick example, uh, we built this kit to support Harvard University creating the first tiny machine learning class, which they decided to bring to their online learning platform. So we built this kit together. This is a Cortex-M4F uh, with Bluetooth. Again, another Nordic part. The, the board that you see there is full of sensors, in, including uh, IMU, color sensor, gesture sensor, but we also interfaced it to a color camera. It's a, it's a slow process, but it's enough to do interesting computer vision. And people have built a lot of different applications with this. So, for example, from detecting if animals have got respiratory diseases just by getting sounds or early detection of um, epileptic seizures, you know, Typical COVID-19 use case, detecting coughs. You know, is someone coughing? I think one of the beautiful things about TinyML that we really, really like is the fact that you can apply machine learning algorithm to small devices. They use very little power. They use very little connectivity because they process the data locally. And they allow you to, to build solutions that have a very where where the privacy is very central. So if you do computer vision on the little board that I showed before, all the processing happens inside the microcontroller. What comes out of the device is just a number. Nobody can extract the image from there. Other solutions tend to stream all the video, all the images to a cloud, and they process in the cloud, but when it gets to the cloud, someone might be able to look at those images. If you do TinyML, you will not you will not know who is coughing. You just know that someone is coughing. Or, uh, you know, these edge AI use cases for us are extremely important. And we have partners like Edge Impulse is mentioned in this uh, page where we do great work together. So I think to conclude, I want to kind of describe a metaphor that I really like. We're a beginner, but a beginner can also be somebody working in a company that wants to build a solution and they don't know very much about the industrial environment, how to build industrial solutions. They approach this as a wall. They're climbing a mountain. You see, this is a very vertical mountain. So you need to be, you perceive you need to be like a very, very skilled climber to get to the top. So a lot of people say, you know what? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bother. I'm just gonna, you know, give up. So they don't apply modern solutions because they don't understand that they can do it. So it is up to us, people who create tools, to change the paradigm and really say, hey, no, 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 it's not a, it's not a mountain, it's stairs. It's a collection of a lot of steps. You're gonna go to the same height, but instead of climbing with great difficulty and danger, a vertical surface, you will take a step, have a little success, build upon that, iterate on that, and when you get to the top, you will have a lot of skills that allow you to build a lot of solutions. Because again, what we learned from putting technology in the hands of everyday people is that when you create the right tools, anyone, anyone can create great projects. So at the same time, in the we feel that in the industrial field, there's a lot of people in companies, in factories, in a lot of industrial environment, that if given the right tools, they can actually directly implement solution that will impact positively their own world, their business, their community. So we really believe in this particular paradigm. So we want people to be able to climb to great heights one step at a time.
Thank you very much. This was, uh, uh, in a way, a short summary of what we are working on. Wow, that was awesome. I've learned so much about Arduino, the projects that these guys, this community's done. And, you know, whilst I love the projects like the robot bartender, I really want that. Um, it's also really great to see the, the super important work that people have done with, with things like Fukushima and the breast cancer uh, diagnosis and more. And I was also thrilled to see Edge Impulse and Sensimil ARM partners featured heavily as well. Mm -hmm. And I know, um, and of course, how you're using ARM technology throughout, which of mm -hmm. course is, is great for, for this ARM tech talk. So mm -hmm. really excited to see that. And an audience, I've got a couple of questions for, for Massimo of mm -hmm. my own, but would love to hear in the next sort of 10, 15 minutes, what questions you've got for him. So get those in the Q&A now and we'll we'll get to those as they come in. But you touched on um, the uh, PSA level certification. You've got level one certified. Mm -hmm. uh, do you mind just reminding, I think because a few folks joined during the presentation, do you mind just talking a bit more about the the products and products you've got certified uh, yeah. PSA certified? Yeah, I will say that the the, the project the, the product we certified is called the Portenta X8. So we created this format for essentially it's it's a small system of module format that we use for microcontrollers, but also for devices that are capable of running Linux. And this Portenta X8 is a it's a device based on the NXP IMX8. Uh, multi-core Linux capable processor. And uh, it's the most powerful Arduino that exists. And we did a few things on that. So first of all, security was very important. So we provided with all the hardware support for secure uh, hardware elements so that we could certify the secure aspect with ARM. So we got a PSA certification. And we're also working with a other partner called Foundries.io. So that basically the software architecture of the device, in my opinion, is very, is very clever because we basically provide a certified Linux up, um, and operating system that can run Docker containers. So we, through this Foundry platform that runs in our cloud, you can remotely deploy containers on a device that's in the field, so you can so you can you have this powerful hardware that's compatible with the Arduino Pro ecosystem that is connected by nature but secure by design, where you can securely deploy your application and keep them updated in the field from a from a user interface. I think it's uh, it's quite it's quite cool. We also developed this uh, carrier board, which is in the Enuk Enuk uh, uh, embedded controller format so essentially a small motherboard where you can connect this x8 on and it gives you all sorts of connections like rs485 can uh, rs232 uh, lora gps uh, gsm uh, ethernet wi-fi blue so it breaks out every single interface you can think of so a lot of people are building applications by putting that module on top of this carrier, developing the solution. And they can also come to us and say, okay, great, I love this. Can I get a number of these boards without all of these features and just this feature on it? So it's much easier to start for an existing functioning, robust certified piece of hardware and take away than to redesign from scratch. So it's really enabling people to build secure application very quickly. Amazing. Thank you so much for that. And, <laughs> you know, it's great to see you supporting PSA. It's super important to us. And uh, I'm sure a lot of the audience are joining interested in PSA certification and PSA certified. So great to see you supporting that. Um, and talking about the Arduino Pro line, we'd love for you to maybe, you know, I know there's a lot of great projects and use cases you've seen in industrial applications for, for mm -hmm. the Arduino Pro line. Do you have a particular highlight, particular <laughs> favorite one, one that really stands out to you? Maybe it was the first one you heard of, or maybe some more recent one that you wanted to, to highlight. It's hard to pick your favorite, I'm sure, but we'd love to hear if you've got it, a particular it, couple. It's hard to pick, but there are two general categories that I really like. One category is what I was describing before as retrofitting. Mm -hmm. In every industry, in every company, there are pieces of equipment that are amazing. They still do a great job, but maybe they were designed and made a few years ago. They're still useful, but they don't connect. So it's hard to extract the information out of this machine so that you can bring them together you know, in a way that you can make them more efficient or make the whole manufacturing process more efficient. So some of the tools like this Portenta machine control and other hardware that we do, and Arduino in a way, as libraries for every protocol that you can think of. So if you're approaching a machine that you don't really know very much, 
and it doesn't have a lot of interfacing out of the box with the with an Arduino hardware and all these libraries, you can create a custom integration for that and expose this machine to the cloud as something that you can create a digital twin of. So that kind of application I really like. Mm -hmm. So upgrading existing equipment so that you don't have to change it. And the second thing is the embedded computer vision. You know, I showed you the, mm -hmm. the insect trap. But you know, for example, I I, I made a pro I made a project for actually one of the for an online event that ARM organized, where I used one of these uh, Portenta Bays, the camera, embedded cameras, to point at a mechanical counter that you see in a lot of equipment right now. And I taking a picture of the counter doing, essentially using basic machine learning to decode the numbers. So a mechanical counter that normally is something that a human has to kind of write down and bring the data out, you just mount this little camera on it, forget about it, that number goes in real time to whatever cloud you're using. So you're removing the human element to this kind of boring, tedious, mm -hmm. go around and read all these indicators. So that application to me is quite uh, sort of quite interesting. Absolutely, they both are um, absolutely fantastic, <laughs> and it's uh, yeah, as you say, I can see why you find those both those areas so interesting. So let's get to the audience questions. I think we've got mm. a couple around the sort of um, let's say the education side, right? Uh, so there's a couple mm. of questions around. Look, I'm an undergrad student. I've started to create basic projects. I want to increase my knowledge in embedded developments and IoT. Mm -hmm. How can I? How can I? Um, how can I improve this? And there's a similar question around. Uh, leading around Arduino education, which is a great source. And is there something that's going to be uh, dedicated to, to pro products as well and pro certification? So could you talk a bit more about the kind of education side and how people could get started with um, uh, with the Arduino products? So depends on which level you start. So for example, you know, one of the classic ways that people have used in the past to start from scratch is to use this thing that we call the Arduino starter kit. So it's a box that you buy. It's got a all the parts that you need and a book with 15 experiments. Each experiment is a project that you build. And at the end of the project, you basically have a working project that have introduced you to one of the elements of the sort of Arduino world. sort of the things that you need to build Arduino application. Obviously, as you progress, we have other kits that we make that kind of teach you more the IoT side of things. On the pro side, I have to say, uh, we are working on some uh, training materials that will, um, so right now, all of the products are quite well documented on docs.arduino.cc. So if you get an Arduino Pro product, you can actually find a lot of documentation over there. But we're also working on some training material because sometimes, you know, when someone who's working in a company, for example, wants to adopt that technology. We're, we're working on creating an actual training program for the pro side. Mm -hmm. It's in the works. I don't have an exact date when it's going to happen, but uh, I think one of the advantages is that there is a big community behind Arduino. So if you get an Arduino pro product and you're trying to build something and you are unsure, you can also go, there's a specific section of the Arduino forum for those applications, but you can also contact Arduino. There's a, there's a forum where you can say, hey, you know, I have this pro product. I'm trying to build the solution. Can you help me out? And there's a team in Arduino that does that. They help people implement. Awesome. Thank you so much. And yeah, keep your questions coming in, audience. These are great. And if you want a particular question, for, if you want me to ask a particular question to, to Massimo, because they keep coming in now, uh, make sure you hit the thumbs up button on the question and I'll get to those first. Uh, so Richard asks um, a question around years ago, when you were first supporting the development of the community of practice on Arduino, what did you find worked the best to help build momentum? <laughs> I don't know. I think it's um, it's a really a combination of things that we did. Sometimes I don't think they were even something that we particularly strategized. Mm -hmm. So, but I would say... Embracing the open source in a way reduced the risk that people perceived in jumping on Arduino as a platform because they said, you know, if these guys, you know, decide to stop making hardware and open a pizzeria, you know, you can still, I can still use everything because it's just out there in the open, it's open source. So that in, encouraged people to, to be part of this. I would say we focused a lot on the user experience. 
a lot of technology platforms, they focus on, oh, look how powerful is our processor or look at how many peripherals there are. But to really focus on the user experience, to make it incredibly easy for people to get started, you know, the stairs metaphor, mm -hmm. that part uh, focusing maniacally on the user experience allows you to have incredible success uh, and build very successful projects and products, even with a Cortex M0 Plus, which is the smallest, uh, probably the smallest uh, core that ARM may, makes. But in a way, the power of the, the platform becomes less relevant if people, people will squeeze every drop of power from a processor they understand very well. Mm. And I guess the other thing that we tried to do was we didn't try to dominate completely the market. So, for example, when people started to, we, we created a platform in a way that we encourage people to create accessories. At the beginning, they were called shields, so things you would mount as an accessory on your Arduino to add features. So one of the interesting things there was that this idea that it would be better to have a smaller size of a really big market as opposed to have 100% of an you know, <laughs> negligible market mm -hmm was a big choice at the beginning. Letting go, letting people come in, sharing away the, the market with other people made the market larger. So these kind of things are sometimes are counterintuitive because people don't want to let go. They don't want yeah. you know, to let other people in. So the open source hardware clearly enable a lot of people to clone our products. So, but you know, the people who do real application will come to the original. Uh, and so, you know, the people who buy the cheapest product will always buy the cheapest product. It's not that uh, yeah. any anything's going to change their mind. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, thank you for that great answer. I hope that answers your um, your question. The next top voted one is uh, my intuition is that young folks who get into embedded with Arduino will be more predisposed uh, to use Arduino Pro when they go onto the workplace. Is this what you expect to happen? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I mean. Obviously, we would love people to progress and, and use. And I think, you know, this is happening right now in a way. You know, first of all, it's happened to me all the time. I was in California like a couple of weeks ago to this uh, Sensor Converge conference. Mm -hmm. I bumped into a number of people that said, hey, you know, I started using Arduino in high school doing silly projects. I got really into embedded development and then I really loved electronics that I never considered before. So I went to university, I graduated and now I'm working at X. And, you know, this is really resonating with a Gen Z audience, no? They really like this approach that favors the ease of use versus, oh, look how powerful this is. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the usability of the platform is really something that it's the real power in a way that they appreciate. And this allowed a lot of these young people to actually go into industry, in, into, into big company. So that's happening. So we believe and we hope that these people will bring Arduino with them. And again, I had a number of people that I speak at events. I say, you know, I was looking at my colleagues struggle on this thing. And then I raised my hand and said, sorry, but if we put an Arduino in here, we could just do it today and just not... So this mechanism is happening, and we okay. see it reflected on, on the fact that uh, people are, uh, you know, coming back to us for this. But also in general, I really want people to understand, to have a way to understand how embedded development works, in a way that's much more user friendly than the way it is taught normally. Then, if they use another platform, okay, you know, at the very least, if they use Arduino, they learn how to use an ARM processor. <laughs> and, yeah, okay. exactly. <laughs> But but it is I I believe that Arduino is introducing young people to the ARM architecture at a way faster rate than other platform. I don't want to sound too you know <laughs> too arrogant, but I do think that we put the ARM architecture in the hands of a bunch of young people. For sure. Uh, so that that's already a nice uh, absolutely result. Absolutely, thank you. And I think we've got time for two quick questions. One is around uh, the Uno four. Uh, I've heard about the Uno 4. I've not looked at the details. Can you tell us what the main differences are and if all the pins are backward compatible? Uh, yeah. So, so the Uno R4 was a, was a logical trans transition for us. So we had this 8-bit platform for a long time. And obviously, we migrated every single other platform 
to 32-bit ARM. So we still had this introductory platform. And one of the challenges was that a lot of the classic Arduino ecosystem is based on five volt logic. And a lot of more modern 32-bit processors, they don't deal very well with five volts. So we needed to find uh, an ARM-based processor, preferably a Cortex-M4 to start with, with five real five volt logic, they would have a native USB. It was very, very difficult to find. And then, you know, one of our partners is Renesas. We look at their really big catalog and we found this part. And we said, okay, this is a good starting point. And then we realized that people want a connected product and they might want just a classic non-connected product. So we made two products with the same architecture. It is compatible. We did test the software side with the 100 most used library by the by the users and uh, or the most installed let's put it this way and, and so we make sure that it's largely compatible the um, the pinout is compatible but it's better so for example it adds a digital to analog converter a real one so you can re generate real analog signals the the analog inputs are compatible but much better there are also extra features like CAN bus and a bunch of other interesting things. The USB connection is now native in the old Arduino. There was a separate chip doing USB to serial. Right now we have a real hardware serial port and a USB based serial communication, which is native. So you can simulate mice, uh, you can simulate keyboards, you can simulate game controls, whatever. So I think we took the platform we kept it as compatible as it is possible, but we migrated it to 32 bit. I did a, we did a core mark test on it. And honestly, in certain application is even 200 times faster than the old, obviously, because you, you have a 32 bit processor that does in hardware things that were done eight bit at the, eight bit at a time in the old one. So on certain types of operation, you get massive improvement, you know? So I think, the objective was to migrate that community to a better processor with as much compatibility as possible. Amazing, thank you for that. And I think we've got time for one more question, which I think is a great way to finish uh, from Parag, which is where do you see Arduino going over the next 10 years? <laughs> well, I will quickly go back to the original statement I made at the beginning is to take complex technologies and make them simple so that you can make them available to as to, uh, to to the largest amount of people, because this will generate an incredible amount of creativity. So to me, there will be always a new technology that we have to make simpler. So let's look at all the tiny ML. It's great, but some of the tools are complex. Even the way machine learning is taught tends to be either very math, math heavy. So if you don't have a background in math, hard, or it's very heavy on this individual framework but something that teaches about machine learning from first principle using the Arduino, in a way, philosophy, would be a great contribution. There's a bunch of other technologies in the future. So to me, bringing Arduino into the pro environment and enabling a bunch of people to do innovation in the industry, it's important. I really like it. Also, I think the this particular industrial application of Arduino tends to be also something that creates opportunities and generates opportunity and jobs at a local level. So if you innovate on something in your community, it will bring value to your community. And I think this ability to improve at a local level something, it's, you know, there's people in Africa building solutions for things they see around them using Arduino technology in a way that's for their community. So this ability to take complex technology, makes them simple, spread them out, and people take them and improve their life at the local level, to me, it's an amazing uh, mission. Couldn't agree more. Thank you so much, Master. Thank you. And thank you, audience, for your great questions as they're coming today. Really, really enjoyed it. It's been great to be in our new studio in Cambridge and for Massimo to, uh, to join us live in the, uh, rather than over a Zoom call, <laughs> as it were, on the other end, somewhere in Italy. So it's great to have you here in person. Really enjoyed today's tech talk. I hope you have too. Uh, we'll be back same time next week, 4 p.m. UK, 8 a.m. Pacific time uh, for another of Arm Tech Talks. Uh, and that will be the last one before our summer break. So do check that one out. Head to arm.com slash tech talks for the link and make sure you register for that one. Uh, we look forward to seeing you there. 
And uh, thank you so much again, Massimo. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you. It's and, been a pleasure. Uh, really, really appreciate it. And audience, thanks so much for your questions. And we'll see you again next time, uh, same time next week for another of our Arm Tech Talks. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye-bye.